Hi, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be able to tell you about uh, some of my work and to be able to introduce some ideas that I've really enjoyed thinking about to you. Uh, this project has to do with the packings of spheres and the free volume available to the sphere on a lattice. So I know there's a lot of uh, words that might seem intimidating at first, but my hope over the next 20 minutes or so is to unpack these concepts and give you some simple idea into what I've been working on. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is, first of all, introduce this problem to you, how I became interested in it, and what some of my results have been together with my collaborators. And along the way, what I'm really hoping uh, to convey is kind of a flavor of what it's like to do research. And even though at times research can be difficult and frustrating because you get stuck on some problem and you don't know how to solve it, what is it that uh, sort of makes it worth persisting and what, what makes it fun? So I want to tell you about how I became interested in this problem and also give you some of these key mathematical concepts. And part of what I like about this problem is that really the mathematical concepts are very simple. So it's just simple geometrical ideas that you're probably already quite familiar with. But I think this simplicity makes this problem quite beautiful. And I also want to tell you about how I became to be an applied mathematician and what that means. So as an applied mathematician, really uh, what I do is I look for problems that are useful, so problems in the real world, and I'll talk a little bit about why this uh, sphere packing problem actually turns out to, to be relevant for the real world. I'm interested in solving these kinds of problems using mathematical ideas. And part of what's really great, I think, about being an applied mathematician is that the language of mathematics uh, can be applied to many different problems. So the same mathematical idea might be applied to problems that on their face seem like they have nothing to do with one another. And so to demonstrate this, uh, three things that might seem like they don't have much in common are red blood cells, art galleries, and packings of spheres. But what I'm going to explain to you is that actually some of the mathematical concepts that, that can be used to understand these different situations are actually the same. And so uh, what I'm showing here is some results from my PhD research, which is really kind of where I started my, my uh, intellectual wanderings. Uh, as I said, one of the nice things about being an applied mathematician is we get to kind of jump around in different topics that are connected by some mathematical threads. And really for me, this uh, started during my PhD. And there I was working on these simulations of red blood cells. What you see in this video is that uh, red blood cells deform a lot as they move through these uh, small channels, for example, the capillaries in our bodies. And it's really important that they'd be able to deform, otherwise they wouldn't really be able to uh, even just squeeze through and, and deliver oxygen to where they need to. And even before my PhD, I'd say, one of the moments where I kind of realized that, uh, not necessarily that I wanted to be a mathematician, but that I liked math, was in eighth grade, my algebra teacher, Mr. Bren, I remember he assigned this bonus problem that had to do with, he, he wanted to build a deck in his backyard. And so he was trying to basically find some uh, way of basically arranging the wood on his deck that would cover as much, uh, as much uh, area as possible on this fence to give him some privacy without spending too much money. So there's this kind of optimization question, how do you sort of make a fence that covers enough, uh, enough area, but at the same time doesn't cost too much money. And I remember like really like going home and maybe spending an hour or so using the, the algebra concepts that we had learned to find this like, uh, optimal solution. And I don't even know if I necessarily succeeded in finding exactly the optimum, but I remember being really satisfied with just being able to apply these concepts to something useful and actually having fun with it. And so it's really that feeling of sort of uh, solving a puzzle and being able to, to 
apply these concepts that maybe seem like at first when you learn them, they seem very abstract, but then when you actually see it put in practice, it can be very uh, gratifying. And so uh, that's really what has led me down this path. And so this idea of um, sort of in my PhD research, I, I really learned a lot about these red blood cells in which uh, you can really think of this red blood cell as some smooth surface. So from a mathematical perspective, this is just some kind of continuous shape. But of course, a computer, when I want to actually simulate the deformations of these cells, a computer is just a bunch of bits. You have these zeros and ones that store all of your information, so you don't uh, have the ability to really represent this smooth surface. You have to put it into the, the storage of the computer, which is this discrete uh, storage with zeros and ones. And so the way that's done is that uh, we take this kind of smooth surface and approximate it by something discrete. And so in particular, the discrete thing that we use is called a triangulated surface, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's just a surface with a bunch of triangles uh, distributed in, in some way. And so if you put that triangulated surface on top of a red cell, you get something like this shape that you see. And so again, um, these, the, the idea here is that uh, what I want to show you is that this common mathematical thread, in this case, the triangulated uh, surfaces or triangulations can be used as sort of computational devices. This is going to recur uh, a few more times. And so in the next problem that may seem unrelated at first, the question is the following. Let's, let's say that uh, you have some director of an art gallery, and he wants to know how many guards does he have to hire. So he wants to guard uh, some art gallery so that basically there's some guard who at any moment can see every, uh, doesn't have to be the same guard, but at every moment all of the paintings can be seen by at least one guard. And so then the question is, sort of given some floor plan, how many guards do you need to, to guard this art gallery? And you can see like in this floor plan, because you have these like kind of complicated, uh, these complicated rooms that aren't really visible from the rest of this floor, if you just have one guard, he's not going to be able to see the whole gallery. So this simple example shows that, well, you might need more than one. And so one of the uh, really, I think, beautiful theorems that has to do with kind of uh, this art gallery problem says that for any general art gallery that's kind of represented it by this floor plan where you have n walls, so you can think of this as like a polygon with n vertices and n edges, you can always uh, guard an art gallery with n over three guards. And there's a little uh, fudge factor because of course n over three is not necessarily an integer. So, well, what does it mean to have one and a half guards? So this kind of symbol that you see is the floor uh, function. And what that means is you take whatever number you get and you round down to the nearest integer. So for example, if I have my floor plan with 10 vertices and 10 walls, I can always uh, find a way to place this 10 over 3, which is 3 and a third, so I round down to 3. So three guards can always uh, be located in a way that they see all of the walls of this art gallery. So again, really, this is the uh, amazing thing about mathematics. You can kind of, in one fell swoop, you can say that all possible floor plans, as long as there are 10 walls, it doesn't matter how you arrange those walls and whatever complicated shape you have, you'll always be able to guard it with uh, three guards. And so again, uh, this idea of a triangulation comes up because to prove this, as uh, was done by Schwatal in 1975, turns out you can first triangulate this polygon. And I'm not going to explain all of the details here, but uh, then if you use this idea of a graph coloring, which comes up in graph theory, you can basically place some different colors at each vertices, each of the vertices of these triangles, and based on that, you, you find this conclusion that n over 3 guards is sufficient. So again, this idea of a triangulation is kind of a key uh, 
concept that comes up again. And so finally, here's really the problem that I want to focus on today. It's thinking about packings of objects. And so here what I want to explain is that uh, a packing should be contrasted with a tiling, which is a, an arrangement of objects that fills all of space. So for example, in this kind of honeycomb lattice where I have these hexagons that are uh, arranged in this kind of honeycomb array, there's no empty space. So these hexagons uh, take up the, the space completely. You don't see any gaps between them. And so this is important if like you look down at the tiles in your kitchen or your bathroom, it's important that whatever makes up those tiles on the floor, that it takes up all of space because you don't want water to be leaking through the floor. But the kind of deep mathematical idea is that you might not be able to make a tiling out of just any shape. For example, if I took circles, it doesn't matter how densely I squeeze those circles. For example, here I have what's called a hexagonal array of circles, but you see there's still some space left over. There's just no way to arrange these circles so that I fill all of space. So uh, what I can do is at the densest possible pa packing, it turns out this uh, hexagonal packing is the densest way to arrange these circles, I'm going to have some highest possible fraction of space that can be filled with, with circles. And if you kind of zoom in and look at just the region that surrounds one of these circles, you see that this kind of hexagonal uh, shape is what determines that, uh, that sort of local unit cell. And if I triangulate this hexagon, again, I can count up sort of how much extra space is left over by just looking one triangle at a time. Here you see if I knew how much extra space there is in a single triangle, then I just have to multiply by six and I get how much extra space there is in the whole cell. So again, this idea of a triangulation is kind of uh, the thing, the mathematical thread that is connecting these, these uh, different topics. And so sort of the grand challenge thing that uh, would be very nice to be able to solve is for any particular object, not just circles and hexagons, but say these like complicated uh, ten-sided uh, polygons that, that uh, we saw in the art gallery case, what's the densest possible packing? How, uh, what's the most space that can be filled? Uh, assuming that you, know, you can't tile all of space, which we know, for example, with circles you cannot do. So this is kind of uh, uh, an interesting, I think, deep mathematical question. And one of the things that it would let us answer, for example, if like there's a competition that says, how many M&Ms are there in this jar? And the winner of that competition will get like uh, tickets to Disneyland or something like this. If I knew how to say, well, I have this shape of an M&M, and I know what the densest possible packing is, then all I would have to do is take the volume of this jar and the volume of a single M&M together with this uh, packing fraction, the densest possible fraction, and I would be able to count the number of M&Ms. And really the, the assumption I'm making there is that when you basically have this jar and you put in a bunch of M&Ms and shake it around a little bit, then those M&Ms are kind of finding a, a packing that's very close to, to the densest one. So that's kind of one example of why this can be useful. And it turns out, so uh, in math, usually we like looking at sort of simple cases because first of all, it's uh, easier to make progress because you don't have to uh, deal with sort of all of the complexity of say these 10 sided, uh, polygons, but also turns out by looking at sort of simple cases, you often learn the most because you kind of extract the, the key ideas of the problem without having to uh, worry about all the complexity. So in that spirit, let's look at a simple case, which is in three dimensions, instead of thinking about M&Ms, which have kind of uh, a ellipsoidal or spheroidal shape, let's just think about spheres, which of course are a very beautiful shape because it's just the, uh, the, the object where every point on its surface is the same distance from 
from the center. So it's a very uh, beautiful mathematical shape. And so the question is, if you just had to pack spheres, what is the densest possible packing you could achieve? It turns out that this is something that in practice has been known since antiquity. Because if you look, and, and the answer is that it's what's called the green grocers or face-centered cubic packing. And basically the way this is arranged is you just take these hexagonal uh, sheets where basically uh, in each sort of uh, sheet, you just pack these spheres in this hexagonal array that we saw for the circles, and then you layer these kind of hexagonal sheets one on top of the next. And so you kind of stack them in this alternating way where one stack is going to be placed so that the spheres exactly fall into the grooves of, of the stack below it. And so if this feels like kind of an intuitive thing to do, that's great because, in fact, you see this all around you. If you look at a grocery store or a market, you'll see that all of these kind of almost spherical fruits, like uh, apples and oranges, they're exactly packed in, in this kind of face-centered cubic uh, arrangement. So this is why it's called the green grocer's packing. It turns out that you can find uh, that the packing fraction in this case, so again, the fraction of space that's actually taken up by, by these objects, is about... 0.74 or 74 percent. So this is a good example of where uh, there's sort of this mathematical problem, what is the densest possible arrangement of spheres, that in some sense the answer to it has been known for a very long time because, well, if I'm a greengrocer or, or uh, the manager of some market, I want to be able to, say, ship my fruit in the fewest trucks possible. And to do that, I need to pack them as densely as I can. And so they exactly uh, solve this problem by using this, this uh, face-centered cubic arrangement. At the same time, actually proving this, that, that this face-centered cubic arrangement is the densest one, has been extremely difficult. So this problem remained open for several hundreds of years. Open meaning no, it was still a conjecture. People thought that this face-centered cubic arrangement was the densest, but nobody could really uh, finish the mathematical proof. So it was called Kepler's conjecture, and here I'm showing just uh, some uh, graphics scrawled in, in one of Kepler's notebooks. And so it was finally proven in 2005 by Thomas Hales and his student Samuel Ferguson, and part of what's interesting about their proof is that it was computer-aided. It turned out that uh, to they worked out all of the kind of mathematical logic and, and the idea of this proof, but to kind of put the nail in the coffin, they had to investigate case by case some thousands of configurations in order to show that in these, in these different configurations, you cannot exceed the packing density. You cannot do better than this uh, green grocer lattice. And so they had these like 5,000 configurations that needed to be checked case by case, and that was not practical to do manually. Maybe it would have taken hundreds of years for a team of people to, to sit down and be able to actually uh, do this by hand. So they had computers uh, do it for them. And an early version of this proof actually consisted of 250 pages of notes and 3 gigabytes of data. So that's different than sort of our, uh, our picture of like a classical mathematician sitting at home, like just writing on... Uh, a piece of paper, really computers are becoming more and more indispensable in mathematics as well as all other walks of life. And so now, moving from this kind of uh, case of packing spheres, I want to talk a little bit about where my research has, has taken this and, and the directions that I've been thinking of. And so for simplicity, let's think about packings of circles in, in two dimensions. And again, this concept of a triangulation is going to be a very important one. So what I'm showing here in, in this kind of bottom figure is that if you look at the position of any one circle and you fix the locations of all of the circles around it, and then you ask sort of what is the region that's accessible to a circle? If I just move it around continuously and I don't let it intersect with any other circle, how much area is available to it, or what is the free area if one of these circles is allowed to wander? 
And so what I'm showing, if you look at like this region in green, you can, again, do a kind of triangulation where these all of these circles are kind of the vertices of these triangles, and you can look triangle by triangle. And in some cases, uh, if you look at these edges of the triangles, this wandering sphere will be will be able to cross an edge if it's long enough, so if it won't intersect with the other two circles at the vertices. But in other cases, when the edges are short, it's kind of trapped. It's not able to cross. And really, our motivation for thinking about this is that this kind of free area, or in three dimensions, the free volume, comes up. Because really, what is a material? Well, this uh, this mineral called fluorite is if you look at its crystal structure so if you look with a very powerful microscope you see that really what you have is basically a packing of atoms so here if you look at the calcium atoms for example you'd find that they're just arranged also on some kind of cubic lattice and so this idea of a packing uh, is quite important because it really can we can really think of materials whether they're liquids or solids, as essentially packings of atoms. And so finding this kind of free volume that's accessible to, to each of these atoms allows us to determine properties of these materials and predict the behaviors of uh, solids such as fluorite. Okay, so, so now coming back to sort of this mathematical uh, idea of let, let's think of whether we can find the free area of a circle, let's just zoom in on one of these unit cells. So I've just taken one of these circles and, and its eight neighbors. And I'm assuming each of these circles has some radius r, and also that, again, they cannot intersect. And one of the ways of uh, thinking of that condition, that two circles cannot intersect, is that they cannot come within a distance 2r of one another, because that would mean uh, that, again, the two circles are overlapping. And so a way to, to, uh, to illustrate that is by drawing this exclusion zone of radius 2r around each circle. And so no circle can come within this exclusion zone of another circle. In this square lattice, we can easily see that there are different limits. So if you're at very low density, if you take this central circle and let it wander around, you can see it can pass through the edges. Oh, it looks like I have some Amazon delivery. Hopefully they give up soon. Uh, this circle can pass through these edges without having to cross into one of these exclusion zones. So it can sort of wander freely and escape this uh, local neighborhood. On the other hand, if you're at very high density, this circle becomes caged by these neighbors. There's no way for it to kind of escape through these edges without passing through one of these exclusion zones. And there are these transitions that occur where, for example, if you're at even higher density, instead of being caged by these eight neighbors, in fact, you lose these diagonal neighbors and you just become caged by four neighbors because you see there are these kind of diagonals that form between exclusion uh, circles of, of two neighbors. And what's really nice is that you can actually calculate the packing fractions at which these transitions occur just using very elementary geometry. So I'd like to illustrate that uh, quickly. Okay, so I'm just going to go to my tablet now. And let's see if I can uh, just make this full screen. Okay, so what I have here again, I've just sketched out this local cell where I have my circles of radius r, and now x is the distance between these circles. It's easy to see that, in fact, I can tile space with squares. So if I just drew a square of edge length x around each of these circles, I'd be able to tile all of space. So it follows from this that if I want to calculate the packing fraction or the density of these circles, all I need to do is take this kind of square 
the tile space and the circle of radius r that's contained within it. And I just need to find the ratio of the area of the circle to the area of the square. Well, that's pretty easy to do because I know the area of the circle is just pi times r squared. And I know the area of the square because each of these edges has uh, length x. So the area of the square is just x squared. And what this results in is a packing fraction of pi r squared divided by x squared. So given some distance x between the circles, I can compute the packing fraction using this formula. And now let's again think about where do these transitions happen? Well, when x is equal to 4 times r, this is exactly where those exclusion circles begin to touch. So the way to see that is, well, when x is equal to 4r, this is the point at which I can squeeze this kind of wandering circle in the middle of this domain. I can exactly squeeze it along one edge where it's just touching two other circles. So if I had uh, an x that's a little bit smaller, just a little bit smaller than 4r, this circle would no longer be able to pass through. So the question is, well, what is this packing fraction at which this transition occurs, where these circles go from being kind of caged by a local neighborhood to being able to wander freely anywhere they go? Well, we can just use the formula that we uh, wrote down a second ago. So we just say, well, in this case, the packing fraction is pi r squared divided by x squared. In this case, x is 4r. So this is just pi r squared divided by 4r squared which is pi r squared divided by 16 r squared. And we see that these r squareds cancel out. And so we're just left with a packing fraction of pi over 16. If you look at the numerical value of this, plug it into a calculator, you get that this is approximately equal to 0 0.2. So when these circles are at a packing fraction of about 20%, that is going to mark this transition between kind of locally caged circles to circles that can wander freely. Let's look at one more of these transitions. So here we're at the close packed limit. So we've taken the maximum packing fraction of these circles. This is where all of the circles are exactly touching. And if I tried to make the units, if I tried to make the distance between uh, these circles any smaller, they would begin to overlap. So this is the closest they can possibly be. And here, so if we just apply our formula again, we have a packing fraction of pi r squared divided by, in this case, uh, the x is just equal to 2r. So it's divided by 2r squared. And this is pi r squared divided by 4r squared. Again, these r squareds cancel out. And we have pi over 4, which is approximately equal to its 0.78. So we found if you have the square lattice of circles, the maximum uh, density that they can achieve is this 78%. Okay, so, so that's uh, what I wanted to uh, show you using my tablet. So now I'll just return to my slides. And so the, the really nice thing is that not only can we calculate these transitions, but also we can figure out how much sort of free area is accessible. And basically the idea is, again, we can just look at the total area of this unit cell. Well, that's just equal to 2x squared. And then we just subtract off basically the, the areas of these excluded region, these excluded zones that come from the exclusion circles. It gets a little bit tricky because we, we actually end up double counting. So we have to account for this by adding in double intersections of circles. So there's some uh, geometry here, but really the idea is very simple. And you can do exactly the same thing in 3D. And so in my research, what I've been working on is really understanding sort of the transitions in these cages that, that occur as the packing fraction decreases. So you go, it turns out, in the FCC, 
uh, in this face-centered cubic lattice, you go from at some intermediate packing, some lower packing fraction being caged by 18 neighbors. As you make them closer packed, the central sphere is trapped not by 18, but by a smaller cage with 12 neighbors. And it's really easy to visualize this using, uh, using some software packages. So in this, uh, in this software, what I've done is just I've uh, represented, I've rendered this kind of local cage of spheres. And what I can do is kind of rotate this around and exactly look at the geometry of this cage. And what I see is indeed this central sphere, it's bigger than this kind of square face. So there's no way that it's going to be able to uh, jump through this square face without overlapping with another sphere. On the other hand, when I look at sort of a slightly lower packing fraction, and think about is basically making the spheres come further apart, in this case my cage has grown because this sphere can escape through the square faces but not through triangular ones. So uh, again, what I'm hoping this illustrates is sort of all of the computational tools that really uh, make this work much more visual and, and help us in kind of uh, understanding the, the geometry of, of these packings. Okay, so um, with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, really say a few last things, which is, first of all, it's, it's true that research is hard, and part of uh, what I think attracted me and, and I think probably most of my colleagues to this field is that that challenge is, is kind of a fun one because you really uh, get to learn about new things and, and maybe even discover something new. And even though uh, sort of the outcome of the research, maybe the final product can be quite complicated, most of the time, the ingredients are very simple. So like in this case, the ingredients are just thinking about the geometry of circles and spheres and these kind of, uh, lattices with very simple geometries in, in two and three dimensions. And also the importance of computers, which certainly in my research, even though I'm a mathematician, I'm uh, really using computers all of the time and, and they're very important for me. Uh, to, to be able to make progress. And finally, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, we have all of these kind of uh, stereotypes of what it means to do research and what it means to be a mathematician. Um, but in fact, it's not at all a solitary endeavor, which may be, yeah, if you, if you just watched some movies about mathematicians, that's what you might think. It's really a very social uh, uh, experience. And part of what I enjoy about my job is that I get to work with my friends and colleagues and sort of learn from them and get to share this joy of discovery with them. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you. I've included my email address and website in case anyone's interested in learning more or discussing uh, with me further. And I just wanted to uh, acknowledge also the support from the National Science Foundation, which is part of uh, how I get funding to do this research, and also Brandeis University, uh, my home institution, where I'm able to interact with students and, and again, uh, work on all of these problems. So thank you very much, and I wish you all a great summer.